Welcome everyone and good afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in, it might be good morning yet still for you guys. Uh, my name is Tommy Ward. I'm your presenter today. This is a one hour webinar on the ins and outs of cloud hosting. Following the webinar, like Amy said, I will be available for any quick questions you might have. And I will be posting my contact information for any other follow up questions. A little bit about myself. I am 24 years old. I work out of the corporate I Bailey office in Fargo, North Dakota, and I live in Moorhead, Minnesota, right across the river from Fargo. I personally enjoy outdoor activities like snowmobiling, hunting, fishing, and generally spending time with my family, especially my nieces and nephews. A little bit about my personal experience in technology. I joined the North Dakota Army National Guard in 2013 when I was 17. Uh, my role in the Army was as an information technology specialist. This introduced me to IT through a 21-week course in Fort Gordon, Georgia. Uh, during this course, we trained in many technologies like hardware and computer service training to more advanced courses like network routing, satellite communications, and other military communication systems. After the Army, I went to school and received an associate's degree in network administration. I've held multiple roles in retail technology consulting as an MSP, managed services provider, network administrator. Two, sum two summers of this included acting as the network administrator for WeFest with over 150,000 attendees. Um, I've worked as a MSP systems administrator and a systems engineer. I also hold a couple industry specific certifications like Security Plus uh, by CompTIA. My current position is as a systems engineer on the Microsoft Cloud Services team here at iBailey Tech Consulting. Here's a little bit about what I'm hoping to cover today. Um, I'd like to introduce you to iBailey and iBailey Technology Consulting if you're not already familiar. I wanna go through the various cloud migration scenarios, discuss what needs you might have to consider before moving services to the cloud, and talk about what benefits you may have and the risks associated with moving some or all services to the cloud. Key takeaways from this will be for you to start thinking about what services or systems you can move, how you and your organization can benefit from migrating some or all services to the cloud, and if a cloud migration is something your organization may be able to handle yourself, or if you should consider a consultant like iBailey Technology Consulting to help guide you along the way. Let's talk a little bit about iBailey Tech Consulting. So we are a Salesforce Gold Consulting Partner, an Oracle NetSuite Partner of the Year, Microsoft Gold Partner, and a Sage Platinum Partner. We have a team of over 225 technology consultants with over 350 certifications combined. And we are nationally recognized in ERP, CRM, cloud, and data, data analytics consulting. Here's a neat little picture of our office location. So each yellow dot there represents an office location. Um, we have a number of remote employees as well. We've been around for over 100 years. Again, we're in the top 25 CPA firms in the country. And we have over 40 offices in 14 states. Currently, we have about 2,000 employees and partners, and we have about $385 million in net revenue. Here's a quick breakdown of how our services are divided up. So the core of our business is in tax services with audit and assurance falling close behind and various other technology or consulting services, including my own role in, in tech consulting. Here's a bigger list of each of those services. I'm not gonna go through each of them. Um, I'll just give you a second to skim through. Here's some of our many clients, um, some of the more well-known nationally and locally. I personally support a couple of the clients on this list um, with monthly, monthly maintenance to their environments, projects, and consulting work. And here's our mission statement in technology consulting. The technology practice exists to solve modern challenges for clients. I like to emphasize on the modern challenges portion as technology, the systems we use and way we do things are constantly changing. We can leverage technology to do things faster and more efficient than ever before. 
So enough background info, let's get into the main intent of the webinar, cloud hosting. First, let's talk about the three primary types or locations of infrastructure. On-premises or on-prem, your traditional server in the back room approach. Hybrid, a combination of cloud and on-prem, commonly a stepping stone to full cloud. And lastly, cloud. All of your core systems operate from the cloud. Your business can be run from anywhere with an internet connection. First of all, let's talk about this picture. So I took this picture on site with a client having issues with one of their systems being down. On-premises networks areas tend to turn into something like this over time due to network sprawl, where we have new equipment installed year after year, no good place to put our hardware, and um, a lot of this equipment doesn't seem to be pulled over time. As you can imagine, these situations prove to make the technician's job much harder, which tends to increase your cost in labor hours. On-premises is the category we use to refer to those who have all of their equipment on site. This might include servers, switches, routers, firewalls, NAS or SAN devices. On-prem environments commonly try to include some of the following technologies or plans to maintain uptime or mitigate downtime during a disaster. Redundant ISPs or having multiple internet providers to make sure you always have an internet connection even if one provider goes down. Hot or cold sites, sites with your data and physical infrastructure replicated for you to spin up if you lose your main site. Backup systems, this includes the software running the backups like Veeam and the backup repositories such as your NAS or SAN systems. The primary issues with on-prem environments are confusion, network sprawl, overcomplicated redundancies, varying technologies leading to IT admin and leadership confusion about what's actually necessary, high hardware cost, difficulty supporting remote work, total loss scenarios where a natural disaster or malware attack wipes out all the systems required by the organization to operate. Hybrid deployments bridge the gap between complete on-prem and complete cloud deployments. Many on-prem organizations will utilize some form of hybridization before completing their move to full cloud. Hybrid deployments are a good way of exploring the value of the cloud, slowly moving systems to the cloud to reduce impact and testing the viability of cloud to that organization. Hybridization also provides a unique value of acting as a migration tool. For example, I've worked with a number of organizations who have established a hybrid relationship between Exchange Online in Office 365 and their on-prem Exchange or mail server. This allowed those organizations to slowly begin moving their user mailboxes to the cloud one by one or group by group until completed, as opposed to moving all of them at once in a cutover style migration and reducing the potential adverse effects of a misconfiguration. An additional benefit to this specific scenario provided was an automatic switch over for users um, Outlook desktop email applications to look towards the new Exchange Online servers away from the on-prem Exchange server for email, which is a completely manual process through cutover migrations and commonly one of the most labor intensive portions of those migrations. Another scenario of hybrid deployment would be where we have a handful of services in the cloud like Office 365 for email and productivity but our core applications are still on site using on-prem hardware and storage. In this example, the organization itself is operating at a hybrid, hybrid level um, instead of specifically a server or system like the email example earlier. Finally, a cloud or full cloud is what we refer to organizations who have no systems on site anymore. All of the servers or data storage devices, applications, and related systems have been moved to the cloud and decommissioned on site. There's no hybridization of applications or servers between the cloud and any physical location. In this scenario, typically the only connection between the cloud and a location or a user is the use of a VPN or a virtual private network, um, site to site or point to site. We'll get into that a little bit more later. 
um, those who require the highest level of, avail of availability should consider a cloud solution with redundant ISPs, as mentioned earlier, um, and training for users for methods to access these systems using a point-to-site VPN from anywhere with an internet connection. With a full cloud deployment, generally, the only hardware needed will be the user's computers and peripherals like keyboards and monitors, switching infrastructure for those large offices um, for multiple users, wireless access points for Wi-Fi, an internet connection, and a router or firewall device. Notably, um, the only requirements for a home or a remote worker would be the computer solution and peripherals, their own home Wi-Fi router, in an internet connection. The primary benefit with this scenario is employees can get work done from anywhere, not tying them to an office or local systems, though we can add policies to limit this um, if you'd prefer to only let them work before or after a certain time or at certain locations. When we refer to the cloud, this encompasses a number of different scenarios. There are three primary models used to categorize cloud hosting, though there are some other models that are pretty specific to a use case. Generally, most cloud hosting fits into one of these three buckets shown on the slide. So the three service models are infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. Cloud service models are simply a categorization. Think of them as types of cloud hosting. There's a million services that can be considered cloud hosted. This gives us a good way to bunch them together. Many services like Microsoft Azure can actually provide multiple services under its umbrella that cover different levels of these service models. Each category builds from the previous. Platform as a service builds upon what's offered in infrastructure as a service. Software as a service builds further upon what's offered in platform as a service. And what I mean by this is something categorized as a software as a service is really a platform as a service, which ultimately is based on infrastructure as a service. Software as a service is the most specific category where there's a final product whereas infrastructure as a service is more of a system from which you can build anything. We'll talk about that first service model. So infrastructure as a service. We'll start from the bottom up and we'll end with software as a service, which is that complete product I talked about before. A couple examples of infrastructure as a service are Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Services EC2, Rackspace, Google Compute Engine or Google Cloud, um, Infrastructure as a service is the ROS level of cloud hosting, providing a hypervisor or a virtualization um, to run guest virtual machines, virtual servers, or workstations. Microsoft Azure, Amazon EC2, Rackspace, and Google Cloud are like the cloud versions of VMware, Hyper-V, or Oracle VirtualBox. There's many more providers of infrastructure as a service, um, these are just some of the ones that are most common that I want to um, refer to. In infrastructure as a service, the hosting vendor handles all of the infrastructure. This might include things like the physical servers. They might have a large data center hidden somewhere with thousands of physical servers running in a grid. Um, the virtualization system or the software that controls all of your virtualized, not physical systems spread across their gear. The network infrastructure, handling the passing of the data between the servers, routers, firewalls, and ultimately back to the internet. The hardware and software licensing, including the costs the manufacturers of the physical gear like HP or Dell might charge to operate the servers, provide warranty for, and maybe maintenance for. The data partitioning, which would be how other organizations' data are hidden from you and segregated virtually, um, and how the systems you deploy are segregated out. Um, the location, so you don't have to worry about building a server room, controlling access, and things like that. Climate control. 
Network equipment needs to stay cool, ideally not below 50 degrees or above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And this can be really challenging for a lot of organizations in older buildings or with equipment sprawl. The more equipment you have in a room, the more heat it's generating and the more controls you have to have in place to keep things cool or those devices will age faster and um, you'll run into a lot of other issues. Um, and then geo-replication. Since a lot of these providers most likely have multiple data centers, they might replicate your data between a few of them. So this protects against a tornado, a fire, or something like that, wiping out all your systems in one fell swoop. Um, geo-replication meaning, you know, spread across multiple different locations. So let's talk about some of the scenarios of infrastructure as a service or how this model could be used. First scenario, an Azure domain controller. You might have a domain controller on site at your corporate office to control your computer login accounts, passwords, manage network permissions, and things like that. Let's say you acquire a new location, but you don't want to invest the money in a whole server for services provided by a domain controller at that new location. You could move your domain controller to Azure with no downtime using Microsoft's free tools and connect your new location to Azure to provide those services to that location. And you could maybe even go ahead and decommission your um, do domain controller at the original site through this process. A second example would be using Rackspace managed VMware virtualization. So instead of researching, quoting, budgeting for, purchasing, assembling and configuring a new server host, you elect to use Rackspace's uh, managed virtualization product. With this, you only need to design your workload, get an estimate for cost, sign up for the service, and begin building or moving your systems. There's no need to set up the on site storage equipment, configure redundancies, or anything like that. Another scenario might be using Google Cloud Citrix Farm. Using the Citrix Cloud account, you can easily deploy a number of Citrix servers to handle the needs of your, of your users. You can easily scale this up or down by adjusting the requirements for, for what you need. Another major benefit here is operation schedules. So through automation in infrastructure as a service platforms, you can actually turn off the servers before a certain time or after a certain time to reduce your computation costs. So that's something that you would never be able to do on site because you own all that gear anyway. A final example would be using Amazon EC2 RDS server with QuickBooks. So if, if you have a QuickBooks server or computer on site and you're hesitant about moving to QuickBooks online because of the changes in the in interface or the high cost of it, um, you could very quickly move your server or computer hosting QuickBooks desktop to Amazon EC2 to take advantage of a simpler remote access for multiple users better backups, or just to get rid of a server or a physical computer on site. Infrastructure as a service gives you the ability to deploy any servers or desktops in the cloud as you would have on site traditionally. The service model gives you the tools to do so in a secure method that's easy to use. Platform as a service. So this is that middle level of our three service models. Um, if you remember, it went from infrastructure to platform and finally to software as a service. This level tends to be a little bit more confusing in its place among the other two, and I'll try my best here to um, break that down. So a couple examples of platform as a service are Azure SQL, Printout SQL database, um, Salesforce Heroku, AWS Elastic Beanstalk, as mentioned, this is the middle level of our three models providing an application platform, database system, development, integrations, and more. You might think of Azure SQL, Heroku, or Elastic Beanstalk as the cloud versions of things like SQL Server 2019 or custom application um, developing on a local machine. In platform as a service, you're provided functions like an easy to use service for deploying apps, 
your developers are presented with an interface to start writing their code in building their applications. There's no need for setting up an app or a tool on their local computer or anything like that. A backend that can be adjusted or scaled on the fly. So after building an app or a resource, you can easily change the, the resources assigned to these apps, increasing or decreasing to save on cost or to improve performance. This also provides a unique scenario. So let's say the project was put on hold or work is directed elsewhere momentarily. You can just shut off those resources to save money. Using cloud resources gives you a lot more control over your costs because you only have to use it when you need it and get charged for it when you need it. Self-tuning resource optimization. Deploying applications in some platform as a service platforms allows for self-tuning or allowing the system to automatically adjust the supporting hardware resource allocations up or down depending on the load. This can benefit the end user by creating a more stable and consistent experience and the developers or creators by reducing cost and adding resources only when and where needed. Unmatched availability because these systems are deployed on geo-replicated and redundant system that's proven. These systems have an extremely high uptime. If there's an issue, a new instance could be rapidly deployed to replace the faulty instance. If a fire or other natural disaster uh, destroys the primary data center hosting those systems, a replicated partner site might take up that load without a notable, noticeable change or impact on the end user at all. Ease of access for many developers, uh, because the application and development is in a cloud platform or developers contributing regardless of location, can easily do so by simply logging in and getting to work faster time to market with developers, no longer needing to plan hardware or systems on site to support those apps. Developers can deploy the apps and increase or decrease resources as needed before or after the development or deployment. Some examples of infrastructure as a service hosting scenarios. So let's say, uh, first example being, you might have an Azure SQL database um, and it's, it's an old database from an accounting software you moved away from. You don't have support for the software anymore from the vendor, and you wanna maintain the data within for historical purposes. Instead of hiding this away on-prem, you could just move it to Azure SQL database to keep it safe. And this makes it very readily accessible. A huge benefit here is maintenance. Being in Azure, you don't have to maintain, patch, backup, or deal with an underlying server or computer hosting that database. All you have is the database itself. Everything else about the maintenance behind that is covered by Microsoft Azure. Another example could be a new application deployed on Salesforce, Heroku, or AWS Beanstalk. Um, developers creating new applications might find a lot of value in using cloud applications or platforms to begin creating and refining their products. Typically, these platforms only charge based on the storage, bandwidth, or compute resources used. Um, and in this scenario, there's no need to find hardware resources to deploy those apps to. Lastly, software as a service. This is our top level um, of those service models because we've already gone through infrastructure and platforms as a service. Um, a couple examples of software as a service are Office 365, like Exchange Online, QuickBooks Online, or DocuSign. This is the upper level of hosting, providing a completed application product or suite ready for use. Software as a service is typically a completed product ready for you to begin working on out of the box. Your main requirements in software as a service will be customizing the product with its built-in features like creating your user groups and accounts, setting up permissions, configuring templates, educating your users and things like that. Um, you can think of Exchange Online, DocuSign and QuickBooks Online, like the cloud versions of Exchange Server 2016, an on-prem file server or QuickBooks 2019, QuickBooks Desktop. Software as a service provides a complete product 
hosted by the vendor, which in turn provides you with a ready to use application suite like Office 365. This would include a number of tools in the suite, Word, Excel, email in the cloud, file storage in the cloud, sharing and collaboration features, as well as advanced security features like multi-factor authentication and mobile device management. Fast deployment and configuration. The entire product is prepared for you, and this is ready for your customization and usage. Lower costs. Instead of purchasing individual per device licenses for things like Office, you pay monthly, thus reducing the upfront cost of the product and making budgeting easier. Scalability. You can easily decrease or increase your resources if you expand rapidly or acquire another organization. Simply add the licenses to your system to support that growth. Any licenses you add, the vendor will add supporting resources to the back end of that system to support those new licenses and users. New releases, um, typically no cost or downtime for the most recent features. A good example of this would be um, Microsoft Online or QuickBooks Online. There's continuously new features and content available in those products. Um, and those features are available right away as soon as the manufacturer or provider releases them. Uh, you don't have to go through that upgrade process. Easier use cloud-based applications are usually um, the cloud version of the familiar desktop application, but they're redesigned and rethought out in their layouts and accessibility, um, which usually makes them more intuitive because they're more similar to other current applications that you're using. Reduced needs for hardware performance on workstations. Um, if you're moving a lot of your apps to the cloud, you probably don't need as high of powered workstations because you're just using those cloud apps. Um, easy resource adjustment for staff changes kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, if you lose an employee, just simply re remove that license and then you can hand off their data and communications um, to the replacement employee or somebody else who's gonna take up that role. Let's look at some examples of software as a service migration scenarios. So an organization needs a faster method for approving invoices with less paper waste. So they subscribe to DocuSign for easy digital signatures. After doing so, the organization might find that they were able to process requests in a timely manner um, faster and save on admin costs. Eventually, to increase functionality further, they might even be able to set up additional workflows with other systems to integrate with DocuSign. Email on-prem is constantly crashing, failing to deliver mail and consuming too much storage as a startup grows. Moving to Exchange Online with Office 365 can provide an unlimited storage for Mailbox and none of the server performance issues commonly found on-prem. This is probably one of the most common migration scenarios that I have personally seen and worked on for clients because there are so many benefits for it. Common issues with mail systems include low storage space, so those small mailboxes, lack of functionality in mail clients, and issues with mail flow. Moving to cloud-based mail like Exchange Online solves all of these issues and more in a single migration. Many of the unforeseen benefits of moving to Office 365 include the ability to create shared mailboxes for users to collaborate through, seamlessness through Office apps, and many security options available without requiring a third-party solution. Limitations in QuickBooks Desktop might result in moving the database to QuickBooks Online, um, which could provide a far more feature-rich experience, easier integration, and easier access among multiple users. Commonly, organizations will set up a remote desktop server and have users connect to the server just to access QuickBooks. Um, there's a lot of downsides to this compared to QuickBooks Online, like server maintenance for your IT team, accessibility issues, less functionality than QuickBooks Online, um, and other things like that. You're forced to patch, license, and configure your underlying server system for that host, um, creating more work for your IT admins. Users connecting to 
the RDS instance must dedicate an entire screen or window to that remote connection. Uh, whereas if you were QuickBooks Online, you might just have a tab open in your browser. In order to access um, that RDS QuickBooks deployment, you might have to use a VPN every time. Um, and while connected, you might have to switch back and forth between your local computer and that server for different tasks. Um, and then there's other security issues involved with that, and we'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, but QuickBooks Online solves these issues. There's no need to connect to another system. Just open that site from a browser, sign in, and start working as long as you've got an internet connection. Cloud versus on-prem. Let's step back and talk a little bit, um, spend some time comparing the cost differences between on-prem and cloud solutions. Traditional on-prem servers and systems are very expensive. Every organization has to purchase the component instead of a single package. Some reports have shown the cost is up to five times more per license. Version locking. Many organizations are afraid of upgrading for the fear of breaking something system-wide. Old versions present a number of issues, like security risks. Systems are using older technologies more prone to attack, reduced functionality needed in the modern world, and lack of compatibility with other modern systems. Many locally installed programs allow only for security patches, not feature upgrades. The product never really improves until you purchase the new version. Some systems might cost you more in maintenance and dealing with the issues, than just buying a replacement, which could have addressed all the issues that you're having in that version. The last one being fragmentation. Um, multiple versions and types of software and solutions spread across the different departments or users in your organization can actually reduce collaboration. This also creates confusion and frustration, not just for the users, but also for IT admins. There's a lot to talk about when we look at costs. From my experience, many are scared away from the thought of recurring costs for subscription and the seemingly high cost of that subscription. What's usually missed here is what's included with that subscription and what costs can be cut from the on-prem solution. Take, for example, an Office 365 migration, including email, SharePoint, a file server, and a traditional on-prem Active Directory effectively a complete cloud migration for that organization. This organization will only be paying a single license for all of these features and removing all of the on-prem equipment. The file server, email server, SharePoint host, and domain controller can be decommissioned. The, the physical server can be decommissioned. Fears of hardware failure is eliminated. Fears of building issues like a water leak HVAC failure or fire are eliminated. Needs for a backup system like Veeam are removed, including the expensive renewal licenses you find with Veeam. You're gaining a vast array of features like OneDrive, sharing and collaboration, never before available on-prem, virtually endless storage, constant upgrades and patching, as well as restoring capabilities. Renewals for the physical servers go away. Server virtual machine additions upgrades go away and confusion about deployments go away. Looking closer at this image on the screen, we see the differences in cost allocation. On the left, you have your traditional on-prem example. In the right is the cloud. You can see the scale of the cloud version is smaller in general, indicating a less overall cost. Why? Well, the on-prem example shows all the cost is beneath the service infrastructure. You're supporting hardware and devices to maintain these systems on site. Maintenance being that continual labor to keep things running smoothly, patches, security feature upgrades to protect against attacks and allow for advancement. IT resources, um, the needs for an internal or outsourced team to plan for these systems, maintain them or support them. Upgrades every few years, Certain portions of the system will require an upgrade or replacement. Training your users, IT staff uh, must be trained on these systems and how to maintain or support them. The on-prem solution has a relatively little cost of licensing as compared to the cloud. 
Looking on the right, we see that the cloud solutions cost beneath the surface is limited to three general areas. So there's consulting, training, and IT resources. Um, consulting, we need to learn which products go with and, and how to use them. Training for your staff and IT team, how to use these new products to the best of their abilities. And IT resources, um, a really common misconception here is that moving to the cloud removes the need for your IT team or support. This does not go away. And I'm gonna talk about that more later on. The cloud solution shows the majority of the cost is in licensing, not beneath the surface, as this licensing pays for all of the vendors underlying hardware development systems. This chart um, kind of helps break down and give you an example of what you have to manage in these different scenarios from um, on-prem infrastructure, platform, and software as a service. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but um, Basically, if we look on the far left, we have traditional IT. So we have your, um, you have to manage your applications, your data, runtime, middleware, all of those items. Infrastructure as a service, second from the left, you have to manage um, those first five and then the vendor manages the other four. Platform as a service, you only have to manage the apps and data. And software as a service, you don't really have to manage any of it. So let's take a little break from listening to me talk and hear from someone else. Uh, I think this video does a really good job of giving a brief overview of on-prem against um, the cloud. On-premise computing versus cloud computing. On-premise computing is a type of computing in which all the computing resources are accessed and managed by or from the premises. In cloud computing, the proof of resources is accessed online. The overall entry cost and maintenance cost of on-premise computing is incurred by the premise that owns it. This translates to diminished returns in the long run, unlike cloud computing which has a usage-on-demand service and is perceived as a utility, pay-as-you-go. Before a company decides to join in on the cloud computing technology, they should fully understand the pros and cons first. Advantages of Cloud Computing Universal Access Cloud computing services are platform independent. They are accessible across many devices with internet connection. This increases mobility and productivity as it allows staff to collaborate on projects. More Storage Capacity Cloud computing offers an unlimited storage as long as you can afford it. You don't have to worry about running out of storage. Easy and quick setup. When using cloud, all you need is to connect to a network or the internet, register with a cloud provider, and adjust some simple configurations, and that's it. Automatic updates. With cloud computing, all this is solely done by the provider. Cost effective. You only pay for what you use. You don't also incur other costs such as maintenance, security, and storage costs. Disadvantages of cloud computing Security risks Since cloud uses the Internet, Internet-related risks such as malware, man-in-the-middle attacks, and eavesdropping can be experienced. Privacy issues The availability of information can be breached when using cloud computing. Your data can be accessed by unauthorized entities or even modified. Loss of control. Using some services of cloud computing means that you lose control over some entities. The entities dictate on how they'll be used since cloud uses the on-demand service model. Internet reliance. If you don't have access to the internet, you also lose access to the cloud. Cloud provider reliability. Since you don't have control over the cloud computing entities, you have to rely fully on the cloud provider. If anything happens to your cloud provider, you will also be affected. This dependency can affect productivity and also efficiency. Should your company move your data infrastructure to the cloud or keep it on-premise? With the advancement of the Internet and increased network bandwidth, businesses should take advantage of cloud computing. In the long run, cloud computing is cost-effective as compared to on-premise, it reduces the overall capital expenditure while maximizing efficiency and productivity. Without a doubt, the positives are outweighing the negatives. 
but each company has different requirements and different comfort zones. It's up to you to decide if this is a good option for your business or whether having an in-house IT department is a wiser choice. Okay, hopefully you guys enjoyed that break. Um, let's transition now to talking about security in the cloud. Um, you might see that I skip a little, a couple sections here. I'm trying to stick to that one hour time. Um, if I go over, feel free to drop off if you need to. Um, if you can stay, um, go ahead and do that to get the full content here. So cloud risks. There are risks associated with everything we do. So what are the risks associated with moving to the cloud? What can we do to mitigate those risks? Latency, one large factor of moving to the cloud is latency. If you have a bad internet connection at some of your locations, those locations might not handle the shift to the cloud as well. Considering your resources have moved to the cloud, some of your processes might need to change. Example being if you're currently using a map drive um, for file shares from a central file server, you might need to move those files to a different system like SharePoint Online or OneDrive for a better experience. File transfers from a local computer um, to a file share on a server over that connection will be a lot slower than when that server was just in the room down the hall. Sensitive data. If you store confidential HIPAA protected or other sensitive data, you're gonna be forced to add more controls to the data, how it's accessed and how it's stored, retention periods and things like that. Some regulations might not allow the storage of your confidential data in cloud-based systems or may require that it only be stored in a subset of cloud-based systems with certain controls applied. Um, security, poorly configured cloud infrastructure can be an extreme risk to your organization and your clients. Um, cloud-based workloads are easy targets because of the accessibility, which is one of the primary purposes of a cloud deployment. However, many platforms are going to give you all the controls you need to mitigate the majority of these security concerns with cloud-based systems. You need to take advantage of these. Examples might be limiting connections to the system from a certain set of IP addresses, allowing connections only from VPNs authenticated by an internal system, MFA, and other controls like that. Compatibility, the process you follow now and configuration of your systems might not allow for a straightforward or one-to-one -one migration to the cloud. Systems might need to be reconfigured and deployed differently, which is also including um, the inher inherent need to train users on the new systems and deployments. Um, downtime, downtime is really inevitable. The largest organizations experience this. We see um, Microsoft and other individuals like that with services that do go down um, at times. The question here is if you wanna put that control in another organization who is um, highly tuned into their own system or trust your own IT team or vendor to handle everything. Um, and, and that's just the choice you kind of have to make. With an internet outage, you're gonna lose a connection to your cloud workloads. Having that redundant ISP in a failover internet connectivity system really should be evaluated. Cloud security. So once you've started to consider moving to the cloud or already done so, one of the first questions will and should be security. How can we utilize a cloud workload while maintaining a secure environment? Most importantly, how do we balance security and functionality? These two things really tend to oppose one another. As we increase security, we tend to lose functionality and usability. When we increase usability and functionality, many times we decrease security because we're working with these systems um, in ways that are the easiest and maybe not always with security in mind. That's why it's very important for the IT admins of your deployment to configure good security baselines and structures to support users um, being able to use the systems in a prevent them from using them in an insecure way. Um, when deployed correctly, the usability and functionality as well as security should be in good harmony, allowing for users to get their work done without fears of security. Let's talk about a couple of ways that we can add security to those deployments. So we can, um, we can restrict RDP, your remote desktop protocol. We can be sure to use VPNs or those virtual private networks, set up MDM or mobile device management, 
enable MFA or multi-factor authentication, and configure connection policies. So RDP, um, that's a, a common protocol that's used by organizations to connect to servers or other systems. The issue here is some IT admins after deploying servers in the cloud are gonna leave this port open for easier access. This is also used in initial setup because there's no other way to connect to the system until you have a better connection method in place, such as a VPN. We'll talk about VPNs a little bit more in, in detail in a second here, um, but the correct process to that situation would be to deploy the servers in the cloud, like Azure, leave that RDP port disabled to the internet, um, and that would just leave you with the only way of connecting to the server through that VPN. So VPNs. What are they? Um, there's many kinds of them, and VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. Essentially, it's a way of connecting to another system through what's referred to as a tunnel or an encrypted channel, which you can pass your information through. VPNs allow you to connect to a system through a secure encrypted method and provide you all the resources you would have if you were on site. There's two primary methods. There's point-to-site and site-to-site -site VPN. Many of you are going to be familiar with a point-to-site VPN. This is your Cisco AnyConnect or Sonic WallNet extender um, that allow you to just connect to that corporate office to access things like file shares. The site-to-site -site VPN um, is something you're probably not going to be as familiar with and probably doesn't apply to a lot of you, but basically that's the VPN that's established between two physical locations or buildings through those firewalls, and it's always up and connected. Um, you can think of that site-to-site -site VPN as, as being something um, connected to like your corporate office and maybe a cloud resource like Azure. Um, and again, when connecting your business systems, you should always use a VPN when you're remote for security. If you're a small business or someone who doesn't have a VPN to connect with, there are services available by various vendors like Norton that provide a VPN solution you can subscribe to. These work by basically passing your traffic through their systems. Um, and the value provided there is it just encrypts the traffic from your computer through the VPN and outward. Um, and all the queries that you make at that point are handed back to you over that encrypted connection. Um, these type of VPNs don't really gain you access to your business systems. It's more of a protection um, against something like a man in the middle attack, which is something um, like let's say you're sitting at a coffee shop on the same wireless network as an attacker, they, could, they might be able to collect some of your traffic and exploit that. Um, as VPNs encrypt your traffic from your computer to the destination, man-in-the-middle attacks are pretty much um, mitigated. The downside to subscription-based VPNs is that you're trusting a vendor to route all your traffic securely without invading your privacy, like that Norton example I gave. Um, each vendor is going to have information out there on how they handle your traffic if you want um, a little bit more reassurance on that. The final thing I just wanted to reiterate about VPNs is the common use cases. Most of the time, VPNs are used to connect to your business resources through a secure method. Other times, they're just used to browse securely from an unsecure network. MDM or mobile device management. This is a security control available in cloud platforms. Um, this basically allows you to have the ability to create partitions on devices to store all of the business information and data that's been cached or passed through that device. If something happens to the device and it's lost or the employee leaves the organization, we can easily delete all of the business data with the click of a button. Those changes don't affect any personal data. Um, with MDM, we can set up policies like requiring a strong password on that device, um, requiring the latest updates and patches being installed, or requiring encryption on the local device. Multi-factor authentication. So many of you are going to be familiar with this. I, I hope all of you are. I'm sure many of you have used this for your banking accounts or apps like Facebook. For those of you who might not be familiar with this, essentially what it is is it's a second level of authentication required for you to gain access um, to a system. MFA opposed to 2FA indicates there might be more um, than two authentication methods. So MFA and 2FA are kind of synonymous. Um, they're just a little bit different in that way. Common authentication methods include things you know, things you are, and things you have. 
So an example of each of those would be um, something you know being a password, something you remind it's you remember it's in your mind. Um, something you are would be a fingerprint or your face for biometric authentication. A third common factor we use is something you have. So this might be your cell phone. Um, this is probably the most common second factor. Um, a lot of times when you log into your banking account, they require you enter your cell phone and they'll send you a little pin code that you can use to log in. MFA really should be used anywhere it's supported, especially cloud or web facing systems. This prevents the vast majority of attacks by blocking users from being able to sign in. Modern MFA allows you to configure certain devices, IPs, addresses, or browsers as remembered resources that are not presented with MFA during every authentication request, making MFA a lot more user friendly and less burdensome. However, again, with security and the teeter totter effect we talked about, um, when we increase that usability, by adding some of these um, easy to use features, we lose security because there's a possibility that a, an attacker could um, spoof your IP address or something like that to bypass MFA. The last one I wanna talk about is connection policies. So one common one is shown here uh, on the image. What this is showing is a connection request from a certain IP address being allowed and the second one being blocked. On the right-hand side, we see our corporate resources like our servers. In the middle, we see a padlock representing the system or firewall controlling these policies. This might be a policy in Azure. On the left, we see two different IP addresses, which might represent two different individuals' as homes. One individual in blue would be an employee, and we know what their IP address is. So we've whitelisted it. The other IP address is an unknown IP. This could be an attacker somewhere trying to gain access to our system. In the connection policy, we define the IP in blue as an allowed IP address and allowed access through the system. And in red, we see that we've denied every other IP address. So basically what happens is when a known one connects, we say, yep, you're allowed to go through and any other IP address is blocked. So that's another really good policy we can configure. Cloud collaboration. So this is another major benefit of cloud-based applications and hosting. And I've got another quick video kind of showing you what that looks like. Um, we'll just jump to that quick here. You've just saved a brand new idea in a brand new Word document on your trusty computer. In fact, most of your work is in office files on some hard drive, but that can be a lonely place for an idea and sending it the old way can create attachment issues. But if you begin in Microsoft Office and save to OneDrive, you can give your documents a new life in the cloud. Sharing from the cloud allows everybody to work on the same page. Teamwork happens easily and naturally using the familiar tools you already rely on. You and your colleagues can work on a document at the same time or add contributions individually as inspiration strikes. No matter which way you work, with real-time co-authoring using Office Online, or using the full installed Office applications you get with Office 365, when you save to OneDrive, you and your team are always in sync. And when your document is ready for prime time, it's already in the cloud, available for distribution and presentation. So start collaborating with Office Online and Office 365. It's easy. Save, share, work together, show. Get started today with Office. So similar to some of the collaboration and file sharing features we saw with OneDrive in that video, SharePoint Online is a centralized version of OneDrive. SharePoint Online allows us to create repositories or locations that we can store files and other data for other users in our organization to access more easily. This might be a repository for the marketing department and one for the IT department. Each user in these departments can sync the files from those repositories to their desktop, making the files easily accessible through their file explorer. When users open these files on their desktop apps, they're able to see live edits from other users and have their changes automatically updated to the cloud version of the file that's shared with the other users. There are many more features of SharePoint Online. It can be used in many ways. The most useful way that I've seen has been as a document repository. 
Google Docs and the features in G Suite, um, many of you are going to be familiar with. It's a free, it's free to use, and many of you can try it out after the webinar to see what it's all about. Uh, but very similar to what we saw with Office 365, you can do all most of these features in Google Docs using their own applications. Smartsheets is a product that's commonly used for project management. You have the ability to create Gantt charts and other process flows to track progress and work yet to be completed on projects or task lists. Smartsheets allows you to publish a project as a web URL, which you could maybe use to create a dashboard or a display TV or something like that. And then Teams. Teams is a central collaboration hub that Microsoft created a few years ago. Um, this has been gaining a lot of tra traction lately, replacing and um, um, a lot of other very common products out there. Um, the tool allows a central channel for you to communicate between employees um, or send individual messages. You can create um, large video meetings with, I believe, up to 250 um, participants and things like that. Let's talk quick about the IT admin benefits. I know I'm running out of time here. Um, a major concern, again, of moving to the cloud is that you are going to get rid of your IT team. Again, that is um, not true. A lot of the, all of these tasks that you're going to have when you move to the cloud are going to have to be handled by somebody. This is usually your IT team or a vendor who you've chosen to do that work. Moving systems to the cloud presents a very different world of management. Although we're reducing many of the needs and common duties of that IT team, it doesn't change at all that we need a skilled IT team at hand. While the team won't be focusing on maintaining hardware, keeping systems patched or updated, they're going to focus on delivering new solutions, integrations, features, and security to your deployment. All of these changes require deep knowledge of the system they're working on and, and be tuned into organization and what's really needed of that system to benefit the organization. Um, some of the benefits for the IT team are going to be ease of management, the ability to manage anywhere, modern features to solve, modern problems, better support, and things like that. I could, I could get into more there, but again, we're running out of time here. Um, so the coronavirus, um, right now we're, we're pretty familiar with how this is impacting us in our business, um, but what technologies could have um, helped us get past this a little bit easier um, with cloud platforms? Um, this is what a lot of businesses have been, or organizations, how they've been dealing with the coronavirus. We've been seeing layoffs, eliminations of employee benefits, budget cuts, compensation reductions, transformations of digital um, strategies. And there's about usually generally three reactions to these kind of issues like the coronavirus. We have our opportunists, those that see light at the end of the tunnel and are doing everything they can right now with their free time and resources to set the company up for success when they emerge from the pandemic um, and learn how to deal with continuing business right now. Um, we have those who are just overwhelmed. So they've dabbled in things, but they don't really have a clear plan of attack. They're just over their heads right now. They want to, but they don't know how to. And then there's your deer in the headlights. Those who haven't started any digital transformation believe the status quo is good enough. And this is how we've done things for years. It works. Why would we change? Let's hide and, and wait this thing out and see what happens. Hopefully some of the technologies we've talked about um, you can think about and, and maybe integrate to help solve that issue. Um, what are some of those technologies that could have helped? Well, we talked about collaboration features and SharePoint Online and Microsoft Teams, as well as some of those other platforms. Um, if, we, if we take an organization who had moved their systems, like their file shares and server infrastructure to the cloud for file management, email and other services like Amazon web hosting to the servers, their infrastructure is ready to support their users wherever they are if they're working at home. The only major change here is supporting users setting up their workstations at home and some of the distractions we find at home, things like that. Um, some organizations who have moved their servers and applications to the cloud may still have a phone system through a traditional provider at their office. One impact of moving remote during this pandemic is a loss of the phone system for communications with customers or employees. 
technology that solves this problem is VoIP or voice over IP. It's the last one in the list there. Um, it's a digital phone system that is cloud hosted commonly and accessible by users anywhere. Um, Office 365 actually has a product for this as well, but there's many other um, providers of that as well. Yeah, so the question is basically um, that we agree the iceberg is smaller, um, that there's a huge benefit for cloud-based systems. And this is talking about when we saw that, that iceberg slide, but this individual wanted to note that they do have NetSuite and other systems go down multiple times a year. That's that downtime I talked about. Again, with that system, we're going to want to really communicate with our vendors who are supporting these systems, try to identify why they're going down the root cause and fix these issues as soon as possible so that we don't run into them again. There's almost always a solution to these issues, but finding the root cause can be very challenging at times. I don't have any, um, again, my information's on the screen. so. Any questions you guys have, feel free to follow up with me personally. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for attending and thank you to Tommy for hosting and we hope everyone has a great day.